I didn't have a choice as soon as you walk in the building, boots, rifle, helmet. It's grounding. It reminds you, you have a job to do. You're doing that job for a reason. And it's not for the fame and glory. And it certainly isn't for the money. You have to want it. And you have to be doing it for a reason that is bigger than just you. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we hear the combat story of Kristen Murdoch, who spent 13 years in the Navy as a Naval Intelligence Officer from an aviation squadron off a carrier to Naval Special Warfare Development Group, or DEVGRU. Kristen spent most of her military time deployed around the world and focused primarily on intelligence in the Middle East, South Asia, North Africa, and the Horn of Africa, including deployments at the strategic level with joint staffs to the tactical with SEAL Team 3 and DEVGRU. After her time in service, Kristen transitioned thanks to a phenomenal program designed for special operations service members and support staff called the Honor Foundation, which helped her find her next career in Silicon Valley, working in the trust and safety space at Facebook, and most recently Twitch as a senior leader. Kristen narrowly avoided being kicked out of the Naval Academy and had her dreams of flying shattered at the last moment, but ended up hustling to find a more rewarding path in Intel that serves as a great lesson for those still rising through the ranks, and I hope you enjoy her insights into the shadowy world of Intel at a tier one unit as much as I did. Thanks for taking the time to share your story with us, Kristen. Yeah, of course, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I've actually never been on a podcast before, so there's a first time for everything. Um, really stoked about this. I actually think this will be probably the first of many once people hear the stories. Um, there aren't a lot of people. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't think that there are a lot of people who have been uh, Intel analysts where you've been. Um, I'm sure we'll get to it. Has to be very few women who have held some of these roles as well. So I'm super excited to dig in. And just as people had heard in the intro, obviously you spent time in some of the really elite units within uh, Special Warfare uh, with DevGru. When my, my initial thought is for people who knew you as a kid, if you had told them one day, like, hey, actually, I was just rolling around with SEAL Team 6, uh, what would they have said? Eh, that tracks. <laughs> oh, tell me. All right. How so? How so? Um, so for, first and foremost, I either got mistaken for being an only child or like the oldest of four which is like a very interesting <laughs> kind of difference. People are like, yeah, you either are going to be like 100% doing your own thing or you're hurting the cats and like getting everybody else to do it. Um, so I think I was always kind of attracted to that cool kind of lifestyle that was always going to be different. I was never going to be, you know, one of the kids who wanted to stay in the same place like my entire life. I had plenty of friends of mine who, you know, throughout the time my dad did 36 years in the Air Force, by the way, um, he actually has a trophy in the Smithsonian um, for the most meritorious flight of the year for 1977, which is pretty cool. Wow. Um, so there are also photos of me getting taller trophy. Ironically, it stays obviously the same size. Um, but like, I've, I've always just been around that type of environment. And I was never the, the person who was just going to be happy staying in one place. Like I always wanted to be challenged at one point in time, you know, when they asked like, Hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, I want to be a prima ballerina and this America and the president of the United States in, in my like eight year old mind, all of that was going to happen at the same time, <laughs> which is adorable, <laughs> but like, no. <laughs> so, got it. And then I got older and also realized that, um, I say the F word too much and that probably wasn't going to fly in politics <laughs> or Miss America. So here we are, but turns out it's in just fine with Naval Special in the Navy. Okay. <laughs> so then we got to backtrack here. Um, are you an only child or are you I the oldest am, of four? I am an okay. only child. Um, although I, my parents do have the very spoiled dog. So, uh, sometimes on the pecking order, I am not the favorite child. Yeah, you're low down. Got it. Very low. Very low. <laughs> so can you tell tell us a little more about this flight that your your father was awarded for? What is the yeah. most meritorious um, flight? 
Yeah. So it's, it's called the McKay trophy. Um, and so my dad did a C5 airlift, um, from Dover, Delaware, uh, I think into Russia. And it was like the longest, longest flight without kind of aerial or all of the things. And so, um, it was part of a humanitarian mission. He doesn't talk a ton about it. Um, mostly because he's like, yeah, it was just a flight. That's cool. And you're like, okay. I mean, the, the same <laughs> thing, like a, I think a lot of our parents are who were in, you know, the Vietnam generation or grandparents in, in World War One or World War II, like they just, they don't talk about those things. And in part, it's because a lot of it, I think was incredibly painful and incredibly traumatic. Um, but the other part of it is like, it's just what they did. So it was expected. It's what like servant leadership and like service of your country was supposed to be. Um, which I think always really stuck with me. Um, I will never forget being, it's my 10th birthday. We were living in Dover. My dad was the vice wing commander. Um, the Gulf war was kind of in full swing. And I remember my aunt had come down from Philly for my birthday and we were celebrating as a family. My dad still wasn't home yet. We did cake. We did presents. We did all of it. Dad still wasn't home yet. Dad gets home at like 10, 11 o'clock at night and comes to say happy birthday to me. And I just like blow right past him, go to the room and slam the door. And if there is one thing you do not do in my household, it is slam the door. I'm lucky I still had a door on the next day. Like, but he woke me up the next morning pretty early. Like the sun was just coming up um, and was like, get dressed, get in the car. Um and of course, like I'm still pissed from the night before. So I'm pouting and we get to one of the C5 hangers, which if anybody has seen a C5 hanger, it is massive. It is not a small space. And we walk in and there are rows and rows and rows of folding tables, American flags draped over the caskets. And my dad just looks at me and goes, I missed your birthday because I needed to be here because that's my oath is to be here when people have done their duty and they can no longer do it. And like, there was just something that in my head yes. that I was like, wow, like there's this, a selflessness that to that. And like, for better or worse, I, unfortunately, I think we've kind of gotten away from that in a number of ways, you know, you hear about the silent professionals and these quiet warriors, and then you have people who are off writing books that may or may not be entirely accurate or being represented in books that may or may not be entirely accurate. <laughs> We're talking about their service in ways that it definitely is not accurate. I, I don't know why people haven't realized, like, you can look this shit up. Like there's, yeah. there's Google, you can find this. Um, and it, to me, I was like, this is this is what leadership is. Like, this is what you do. This is this people first mission always kind of mentality. And it just, it just kind of stuck with me. And like, from that point, it was sort of like, I knew that I was going to go into the military. Didn't necessarily, well, I was going to say, I didn't necessarily know which branch, but I knew I was not going into the army. No offense. Everybody has their line somewhere mine happened to be that. Um, but like, that was just something that it, it was always, I think something that was going to happen and a bit maybe predestined, um, to happen. And yeah, it's just, it's just one of those things that like, you never, you never really forget. Yeah. So that was kind of the, the, that origin story for you was that day. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. Wow. Um, just out of curiosity, before we jump to kind of your time at the academy, um, how many times had you moved as a kid? Um, oh man, I actually just did this for as part of an intro slide for moving to Twitch. Um, I think it was eight eight moves as a kid. Yeah. So the academy was my thirteenth school, twelfth or thirteenth school, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So uh, actually. Uh, and I, I grew up overseas. My dad was State Department, so we moved different countries. We moved a lot. Not that much, actually. Wait, the, like, 
the State Department or he was State, true State Department. Department. Yeah, people who listen to this will know because I, I, whenever I touch on this, like the first thing I did when I got to the agency was look up my dad to see if he was yeah. there. And he was not, but I kind of knew he wouldn't have been. Like his skills were truly on the state side, and he was. Yeah. He was an Army helicopter pilot in Vietnam. He had done some cool stuff, but he was yeah. much more your like prototypical diplomat. Yeah. So yeah. that's what he did. But I moved a lot. What um. How valuable do you think those experiences of moving were for you when you went into the Intel community? Oh, incredibly important. Um, I also think like this is actually where being an only child really came in handy because mm. I had to, and I had to meet people. Yeah. I had to meet friends. You had friends. nothing I, else. Yeah. I had nothing else. <laughs> and I'm also like, I tap out on the extrovert scale, like every time I take the Myers-Briggs. So like, there was no way I was going to be like by myself. And so like you get to talking and if anybody ever happens to be in the San Antonio area and like you're in the grocery store with my mother, if you're wearing anything that says the Naval Academy, the Navy, SEAL Team 3, whatever, inevitably she will strike up a conversation with you. That's just how she is. And like very much my mother's daughter, which is a good thing because if I had moved around so much, if I wasn't that way, I would probably wouldn't have had a ton of friends. Um, And then when I became into the Intel community, I was like, oh, it was very easy for me to kind of start to read people, to understand how, how people click. Like some people were on like the three cups of tea plan. I was like, no, we're like five seconds in to the first cup. Like I I got this, (laughs) but it, it also just made it really easy whenever I come into someplace new from a leadership position, it wasn't, Hey, I'm coming in as the two. I'm coming in to lead this team. It was, yes, I'm coming in to lead, but like, I also want to learn and understand where people have been, where they're going, where they want to go as just kind of a natural part of like, tell me, tell me all the things about you, which actually turns out to be a very marketable skill when you go into the human world. (laughs) It's so funny because I do a lot of that too. And I hadn't really pulled it together, but maybe that's something about moving all the time and having to make friends. Mm -hmm. You kind of like, take a backseat yourself and really ask people a lot about themselves. Yeah. And when, um, and when you become an adult, then you have to remind yourself, like, am I asking these questions because I'm truly interested or like, am I Jedi mind tricking people? Because I, I need to not <laughs> need to not Jedi mind trick them yet. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Go with the first one. <laughs> For people who are listening, surprisingly only about 40 to 50% of the people who listen to this are military background. When you say the two, Assuming yeah. like J2, like what do you mean yeah. just for people's, con- for context? Yeah. Um, well, actually, that's a really good question. I think it could be, it means a couple of different things to people depending on on where you're at. Um, so my first kind of job is the two was with VFA 154, um, the good old Black Knights out of Lamar, California, um, where the Intel shop is like a baby ensign fresh out of Intel school. An Intel chief who is the one who really knows what's going on and to hopefully just kind of keep the ensign from getting in trouble, getting arrested or like accidentally getting rid of classified material because you didn't pay attention to the fact that people shut the safe and then accidentally threw things away because that's never happened to anybody before ever. (laughs) Um, And then maybe like one or two um, junior enlisted Intel specialists. Um, My time as the two at SEAL Team 3 was then myself also a chief who was keeping me out of trouble. Um, but then we also had a mix of junior and senior Intel specialist. But the bigger difference there was like, I had a real seat at the table um, in the kind of the command structure. And like in the aviation community for better or worse, like they looked at me to understand like, hey, where am I dropping bombs? Where do I get gas? Um, also, please tell everybody that I'm great on my security clearance interviews. Um, <laughs> whereas when you get to kind of the, the team side of the house and the special operations side of the house, it's, it's a lot more intense. Like you're, you are giving them information that is literally going to change potentially life and death situations. Um, and so when you talk about the two, yeah, it, it's just kind of different depending on, on where you're at and the more senior you are. Um, I, I definitely think that I like, I preferred the more senior, less of the Hey, you're responsible for my security clearance. <laughs> yes. <of> work. <laughs> no doubt. And then 
And I, I don't actually know why we do this, but the two is the Intel shop, right? And then mm -hmm. one is usually like your HR admin. admin. So for yep. people who are listening, if you're like, hey, you got to go see the S1 or the J1 or the G1, it's just different levels. But if yeah. you're at a battalion in the army and they say, go see the S1, you're going to like human resources. Then three is ops, yep. four is logistics, five is like long-term strategic plans, plans. six is yep. comms. Six is, six is comms and your comms. IT guys. And There you go. Man, the number of people who think that the six, a six and a two are the same number. Do they? I'm like, I, I'm not run into that. I'm like, y'all got to have problems balancing your your checkbooks if you think that those two numbers are yeah. the same, because that could be a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> Very like, different people. I mean, how do I how do I work my computer? I don't know. There's a reason that I own a Mac. <laughs> You're gonna have to talk to the guys down the hall. They're like, "What's That's your funny. job?" Isn't it? And I was like, "Oh no. <laughs> no, how would you like it if you're a fighter pilot?" And I'm like, "Do you do you like being a backseater?" And they're like, "No, I'm a front seater." Well, cool. I'm an intel officer, not an IT person. I can't help you. <laughs> it, that is so true. That's so true. Like every part of the military that has these these shops. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so we talked to two and a little bit of that evolution, which is great. So let's backtrack real quick to the yeah. academy. Yeah. Why did you go to the Naval Academy and what was the discussion like with your dad or your mom in this part, yeah. but like with your dad doing 36 years in? Yeah. Um, that's, <laughs> well, I think probably the better question is when I went for my, so you applied and you can have to get either a congressional nomination or if you're the child of somebody who's been in active duty, you can get a presidential nomination, neither of which are particularly guaranteed. Um, so I applied for both. And I went to my congressional nomination interview and it was one air force Lieutenant Colonel, and then two army full bird colonels, um, both of whom went to West point. Um, and they were like, so you applied to air force and Navy. Why did West, why not West point? And I was like, I'm from South Texas. I don't like the cold. And also school looks like a prison. And the guy was like, it kind of is a prison. And I was like, you're not selling it. Oh. <laughs> no, I like prison up North, slightly bougie school, either in the mountains or on a river where everybody goes sailing, like not a tough choice there. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of the day, I also wanted to fly. And ironically, kind of at the time, being able to get an aviation seat at the Naval Academy was a hell of a lot easier than being able to get one at the Air Force Academy. Okay. So I applied to like nine different schools. The Air Force Academy was the only one I didn't get into. Um, probably for the best, because like the next two years are when they had like the massive scandals around cheating and sexual assault. So like may have just, may have just yeah. chosen right. Um, and, but my parents were super happy. They were really supportive. Um, I was happy knowing that like they weren't going to have to pay for school. Um, although I should probably thank everybody listening because they all actually pay for my school through my taxes. So <laughs> true, true. But I'm paying for everybody else's, so I guess it works out in the end. Um, paid it back. Yeah. yeah, they were they were just they were really happy, and they were happy that it was where I wanted to be. Um, although looking back, I think everybody who's been through one of the military academies can always kind of agree on like. It's a great place to be from, not a great place to be at. <laughs> so. Or to go back to is probably fun, but yeah. Right, so right. Was it smooth sailing then through the academy? Oh God, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, I went through, let's see. I also realized that um, if you're slightly dyslexic, going to an engineering school is not the smartest decision that you can make. <laughs> So, um, I took a lot of summer school. I barely squeaked by with my GPA. Um, I did pretty well in like my actually like major classes. I majored in political science. Um, but my, God, my engineering and like math and science were just awful. It didn't help that I also didn't follow the rules all the way. Um, and had a tendency to just sort of find myself either like tangentially related to people who were in trouble or like in trouble, but just like for stupid things, like people, when you get in trouble at, at the Academy and they're like, Oh my God, you're on 60 days restriction. You have a hundred demerits. Like, what did you do? Like you hopped the wall, you cheated, 
you must have had sex in the hall. Like, what happened? And I'm like, I went to the Build a Bear store with four other cheerleaders from the Naval Academy, and we built Naval Academy cheerleader bunnies. And I went out in normal clothes. No. And they're like, well, that's quite anticlimactic, isn't it? And I'm like, yeah, I didn't even get in trouble for anything good. I got in trouble for stupid shit. But in some ways, like getting in trouble for that, and like I had to go see the superintendent and basically like beg to not get kicked out of school. Um, I ended up spending most of my junior year on fourth class privileges, which was also not a good time. Um, but I also had to go through this remediation program with one of the 06s, so one of the captains um, at school. And I got this female SWO captain and she scared the ever living daylights out of me. She, first of all, she's like almost six feet tall, just like this incredibly like beautiful, strong woman. And I was like, I am so intimidated. By you because what, I've what's never a for people who don't know yes a surface warfare officer so she was the the captain of her tour before the academy was um she was the captain of a guided missile destroyer and i was like I, i've never seen anybody like you Badass. most of the people yeah. that i see in the military are white men of varying heights this guy and so yeah. like this for me was something i was just like oh my god and i learned so much from her and like she didn't let me get away with shit <laughs> like if I tried to like sort of fax something and be like mm, I don't really want to go deep here we're just gonna like tiptoe a little bit like she would call me on it so fast and I had to write a paper at the end of this remediation process kind of about what I learned and accountability and integrity and that was even after like i I have a master's, even writing my thesis was easier than this. And it just took so much soul searching to recognize of like, I could have lost a lot by doing some really dumb shit. And like, was, is that worth it? And so like, there are times where like, and, and this sort of, is it worth it? If I if I decide like, mm, I want to break curfew, I want to go to do this. Is it worth standing in front of the commandant of midshipmen and the superintendent, both of who went to bat for me and be like, mm, yeah, sir, thanks for that. But like, I decided like going out and like getting shammered was more important. Like, no, absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. And then I went for my meeting with the superintendent to find out if I was retained. And he was like, you know, your dad called me, right? And I was like, oh. I was like, nope, nope, wasn't aware. What did, what did, what did he say? He's like, he told me that if I thought it wasn't good enough, I should kick you out. And I was like, sounds, sounds about right. Actually, uh, I get that. <laughs> and he, it was very clear of like, if you don't deserve to be somewhere, if you don't deserve what you've been given to, if you squander that, like that stays with people. And it, so even, even now, like I, I fast forward in my career and I, I have all of these times in my head where I'm like, is this worth it? Should I be doing this? And it, instead of being called in front of the commandant or the superintendent, I was like, would I be happy if I got called for into, into in front of Congress <laughs> for this? Exactly. <laughs> like, it, Moral compass, not entirely due north, but like, you know, it's within like a couple of degrees. And, and so I realized like how important my integrity really was to me. And like, you can't put a price on that. And I really lucked out because I learned that lesson when I was 20 years old. Yeah. I have, I have people who I've watched them learn that lesson at 30. I've watched them learn it at 40. I watched them learn it as they were a command master chief and ended up getting a DUI the day after the the Christmas party. Yeah. And like, career's gone. You're done. I'm like, is it, is it worth it? Right. Oh, Almost yeah. never. So you had mentioned earlier that 
part of the allure of the academy was it was not as competitive for a flying mm -hmm. slot. But I have to imagine once you get in, it's incredibly competitive. Is it naive of me to think that you probably are not as competitive after going through something like that, what you just described, remediation? Um, it, it depends because so much is done on your class rank. Um, for me, like I didn't, I didn't really care if I was in the front seat or the back seat. I just wanted to be in something with wings. Um, and so like I actually service selected Naval flight officer. So to be a backseater. Um, and then I got medically disqualified the day before graduation because Pensacola at that time was one, they weren't granting waivers for like anything, unless you had had like, photo radio keratotomy PRK um to correct your vision. Other than that, like if there is anything else that you had maybe gotten a waiver for, you weren't you weren't getting in. Um it was also about the time that like people would show up to Pensacola and they'd be like, tell everybody, you know, look to your left, look to your right, person in front of you, person behind you, like four of you will be gone by the end of this because we have too many pilots. Like they were asking people like, hey, if if you went out and Take people it. just paid for a $250,000 education for you and you don't want to serve, like raise your hand now, like go for uh. it, knock yourself out. Um, and so it came, it came to light that I had had an eating disorder when I was in middle school and high school. And so they wouldn't give me a waiver and I lost my mind a little bit the day before graduation. Yeah. And the guy who is in charge of all the service assignments, he's like, well, you can, you can go Marine Corps now. And I was like, are you, is the Marine Corps going to let me fly? And he's like, no, you still have to go through Pensacola. And I was like, no, absolutely not. I was like, make, make me an Intel officer, make me a JAG. He's like, are you going to go to law school? I was like, mm, I probably don't have a grade to go to law school. So no, probably not. Um, I was like, Intel, sure. Intel sounds great. And he's like, we're going to need to make some phone calls. I was like, you do do that. You make some phone calls. <laughs> so you had made it like, through like the gauntlet basically to get selected for aviation there. Yep. And like, yeah, it was, it was, I got called in right before the last parade of the season. And like, I remember being in this office and like took my parade sword out. I don't know what I was going to do with it. Like wave it around like a mad woman, apparently <laughs> I was like, what? okay. And so graduated took, had Memorial day weekend where I got to see some of my best friends and most amazing humans in the entire world, the Navy men's lacrosse team in 2004, almost, almost, almost beat Johns Hopkins in the NCAA championship. Um, unfortunately lost in, lost in the final game, but, and then went right back to the Academy to be like, so what am I doing now? Yeah. <laughs> and until it was, and turns out, everything happens for a reason. And I probably would have been a miserable pilot. And after doing, you know, a, a tour with the black Knights, like it was great, but I was like, this doesn't, this doesn't do it for me. Like, yes, the thrill of flying is great, but like, I don't, it's not enough for yeah. me. I need more, more than that. And again, going back to like, not being super great at math, like, no, <laughs> probably not good. <laughs> What a serious career, like probably four years you're just planning to go fly and then that happens. So I like mentally well, I mean, like, had to have been so my tough. whole life. Yeah. My whole life I had been planning to fly. Yeah, your old man is a pilot for a career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Did you did you and he talk this out? Oh, I mean, I they were so they were in Annapolis obviously for commissioning week and I was like in tears as I was getting ready to go. My mom's like, what is wrong? And I was like, I can't talk about this. <laughs> and I talked about it after my dad's like, you don't really have a choice. Yeah. And I was like, I know. And like he and I were sitting outside, like smoking cigars and it, like, you can either, you can either do a cop this, you can either go Intel and be really, really good at it. Or you can go and you can hate the fact that you had to do it and you can suck at it. And like, that'll be the end of it. And I was like, well, that wasn't a hard choice. He seems like very but no nonsense. He is. Yeah. He's great. <laughs> oh, geez. 
Okay. Man, that's a, what a course correction. So, yeah. So you make this change, you end up going Intel. Mm -hmm. Where, where along the way, I guess your first assignment is to an aviation unit. How do you kind of go into that with the right mental frame of mind? Yeah. Um, So it was interesting when I went through Intel school, um, there were actually like a couple of guys in my class who had been pilots or who like who had even gotten all the way to Pensacola and then like washed out. And so they transitioned them into Intel and like, they always had this like chip on their shoulder. And I mean, it's the same with, with, you know, Naval special warfare. Like you have guys who went into buds and who washed out of buds and who then went Intel and they always like, you can tell they carry it with them. And, but I remember asking one of my instructors who um, had just come from um, a carrier air wing Intel officer tour. And I was like, you know, what, like, what advice would you give me? Like, I'm the first one who's going directly to the squadron. Like other people are kind of like hanging out for a little bit, but like I'm meeting them on deployment. Like what, what, what do I need to know? Like, <laughs> Give, give me like the, the bottom line up front version thinking that he's going to tell me like something really, like really prolific that explains why he made me memorize like what the weaponry is on an F-18, which I never used. That's why they have gunners. <laughs> like they, I don't need to know that. But, and so I was waiting for this and he's like, well, he's like the thing that you need to know. He's like, there are three types of women in the Navy the bitch, the slut, and the dyke. And you need to figure out which one you're going to be. Because if you don't, they'll put you in a box for you. And I was like, no way. Somebody um, said that out loud. A lieutenant commander said that out loud. I mean, this is like, all right, again, like 2005. So like, we're, we're just far enough away, but clearly not far enough away. Um, and I was just like, uh, well, guess I'm, guess I'm going to be the bitch. <laughs> That's really like the only option left for me. And, but it kind of started me down. Like, I was like, I'm going to have to have a tough exterior. I'm going to have to not take things personally. Like I'm going to have to be one of the guys and I'm going to have to be really good at being one of the guys and getting my resting bitch face, which turns out it's just actually my face in place enough to where like people aren't going to second guess me. And my biggest fear is like, I'm going to get there. These guys are clearly going to have done their homework on me. They're going to know that like, I'm this blonde cheerleader from the Naval Academy from Texas. So like none of those things are going in my favor and I'm going to have to get them to listen to me. And I was just like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. So I showed up on the carrier and I flew under the carrier. I'm like waiting for somebody to come and pick me up for like a good, like three and a half hours. I'm like, it's an aircraft carrier. I can't just go like walking around by myself yet. I don't know where anything is. And I see this guy and he walks past like a couple of times. And finally I was like, Hey, are you, are you here to pick up your new Intel officer? And he's like, yeah. Why? And I was like, I think that that's me. And he's like, I don't think so. We're supposed to be getting a dude. And I was like, no, I think that that's me. And he's like, he's like looking me up and down. He's like, I don't think so. I was like, what's the name on the paper site? And he's like, Christian. And I was like, mm, I solved your problem for you. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Kristen. And he's like, oh shit, you cannot stay in the eight man. And I was like, no, sir, I cannot. <laughs> Wait, you could not what? He was like, because they thought I was a guy coming in. And so they had me in one of the state rooms <gasps> with like seven other dudes with the squad. Yeah, that's not like, gonna oh, work. This, this is not this is not gonna work. <laughs> he's like, also, he's like, I can hear him like muttering under his breath in front of me and he's like I don't know what he's like I don't know what the wives are gonna do this is gonna be a big problem and he's I was just, just talking like, to what? himself like he I is. got I a lot like, of things on my mind now I was like I just got here I'm like I flew into Bahrain flew to the carrier I was like what in the hell is happening here 
<laughs> and of course I get in and guys like our new Intel officers here and literally everybody looks at me and then like kind of does like one of these to like see like well somebody standing behind her and I was like no guys it's it's me you're stuck with me wow also wow. I, I flew out here so unless one of you wants to fly me home like from what I understand like your fuel rate's not that great so like we're here wow so that was a tough initial, tough start, let's say. Yeah, but you know, we we figured it out. Um, the wives eventually eventually figured it out. That went better for some people than others. Lesson learned, folks. If you are married, don't lie or hide things from your significant other. They're going to find out. It doesn't matter what it is. And definitely don't lie to them and tell them like, oh yeah, you got a new intel officer who's a dude because. They're oh, going to have to go worse. back home at some point. <laughs> like they're going to know. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting. Jeez. So actually one of the things that you had mentioned before, as you were, as you were talking, I was thinking about this. So I, I flew helicopters, not jets. So I can't, it's not, I know it's not the same thing. And then I went into Intel. You and probably liked your life a lot more. No, well, it's funny because <laughs> I I wanted to fly, like I was excited, but I didn't have this lifelong dream. And the Intel world was much more interesting for me. And I think yeah. that it made it was more strategic. Like I know guys yeah, who are absolutely. and ladies who are still flying today, but you're still in the same cockpit. You might be responsible yeah. for a slightly larger number of aircraft. But I am sure the stuff we're about to talk about, like the things that you ended up doing because you were an in Intel were like national level. Uh, impact, you yeah. know, not to say that there is an impact flying off a carrier and hitting targets and, and that type of thing. But I think f I, I have a similar feeling, I guess, is what I was yeah. thinking about as you said that. So it makes total sense. I mean, and at uh, the end of the day, it's what, it's what drives us, right? It's what we're passionate about. And like, you need people who are super passionate about getting into that cockpit yes. and like, regardless of what size the plane is or what type it is. And you like, you need the people who are like passionate, who will 100% live and die by the salt of that sea. <laughs> yep. But that just wasn't me. And like, I, I know it wasn't you. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's probably why we go and punish ourselves with like master's <laughs> programs. It's like, how can I get more of this strategic stuff? <laughs> so, so you mentioned your, your first assignment, your Intel on the carrier, mm -hmm. and then later we go to the teams. Yeah. Could you kind of share the difference in the work of an Intel officer when you're in those environments? Kind of maybe like yeah. even day to day or just give people an idea of what that's like. Yeah. I, well, I think the first thing is that it, it, because squadron and officers, like that is your first job out of the Navy. Um, very, very few people, very few ensigns coming out of Intel school are going to the teams. Um, and they're going as the two alpha. So essentially like the two's right hand, right hand person, um, super few and far between for those, like for obvious reasons, like you're limited on the number of SEAL teams. Squadrons are much more plentiful and there are a ton of them. Um, but they also, there's also kind of an assumption that, and the, the Naval Intelligence community has sort of put a premium on things that are Intel roles that are seafaring, sea fighting. And so whether that's to be a destroyer squadron Intel officer, um, working with a lot of the SWOs in a number and like actually being on a destroyer, um, even like the major combatant commands, like with the exception of CENTCOM, um, and even then, CENTCOM's really kind of obsessed with Iran and so in the Strait of Hormuz. So like, <laughs> you're really talking about like the seafaring Navy. Um, and so everything in your first tour is kind of pointing you towards this continued seafaring Navy role. And so things are basic. It's like, how are you doing targeting? How is how is the ship actually working? How do all of these pieces with the squadrons and the air and the carriers and the air wing and whatever else like actually work together? Um, and it really is just kind of like start to build your acumen. Um, but for me, it was oh, at least when I was on on deployment, like it was pretty routine, and it was kind of like I could do that in my sleep, like. I would get up in the morning, I'd get breakfast, I'd run, I'd start to look at what like the combined air operations center had sent out for the flight plan for the day. I'd start pulling through what I needed for the air wing. I'd start building the briefs, which really just 
we're changing out call sign numbers. Because I, the emissions are just very similar day to day, right? Just, You're just rotating who's flying mm-hmm. in, in the aircraft. Yep, exactly. And so, you know, you're kind of like, well, all right, so this is, this is just, this is it. And then you do the post-mission briefings on the back end, but it's all just very, very routine and like, it's great, but like kind of boring. Um, the work with the teams was so much more dynamic in part because I think the Navy is still almost figuring out what to do with kind of the special operations community. Um, Mostly because like you've got Rangers and Delta who, you know, the army just has the ground side of things down. And then you have a, a bunch of surfer dudes (laughs) dudes <laughs> really jacked coming in being like hey guys what's up um <laughs> that makes them sound like they're, they're not all like that but most of them do surf and a lot of them would surf like <laughs> off the coast of Mogadishu which I think is hilarious that um is apparently hilarious. there are actually like some pretty good waves there um well you just have two very different dichotomies of and skill sets of of what they need to do and so I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about my time with the teams is that they're incredibly versatile of the types of missions that they can do. Like it is everything from like going on the submersibles, ground raids, you know, you name it, they can do it. And they're really good at it. And so being able to be in a position where you can support and start to think through and understand, okay, well, if they're going on X type of mission, what do I need as an Intel officer to be able to give them what they need? What can I actually give them? What can I find and what can I learn and what can I share that actually provides a lot more additional context that may actually end up shaping how they think about the mission and how they think about executing what, what their, their objective. And I mean, it's, it's really fascinating when like you get you're in a room and all of a sudden people look at look at you and they're like, well, what do you think? And I'm like, I haven't had somebody ask me what it is that I think in a really long time. Let me tell you, I will tell you all of the things, <laughs> <laughs> but also like I left out because I spent a lot of time, spent all my time in Middle East, East Africa, Afghanistan, Pakistan. And so like, there were things that I just inherently followed because I was interested in it. Um, When I was at SEAL Team 3, we were getting ready for a deployment um, with the crisis response element out in the UAE, but we were also going to have a small detachment of guys in Yemen. And I am watching all of the traffic come in about what we then called the Houthi apocalypse into Sana, and they came into the airport. They were stopping Decker guys at checkpoints. Agency guys were barely getting out. They were taking the embassy. Like all of these things that we had been, that we were like, well, it's just the Houthis. Like it's not a big deal. They normally just stick to the border. All of a sudden, like totally upended things. I remember having like my CO was, and the, the team guys were in a briefing, and I kept having to walk in and be like, sir, the Houthis have taken the airport. And then like I'd leave, and then like 15 minutes later, I'd come back, I'd be like, uh, I don't know if we're going to Yemen. <laughs> oh. He's like, what do you mean? And I was like, I don't know if we're going to Yemen. Like, I don't think we're going. But then being able to, you know, actually speak from a position of understanding and authority of like, hey, these are all of the different situations and scenarios that could happen. And like, these are the second and third order effects of like, if X, then Y. And like trying to think through and figure out what the impact is like, does that mean that we send more guys to Afghanistan? Does it mean that we send them somewhere else? Are we putting more people in the Philippines? Like, how do we think about now? Because we've got this detachment of dudes. And so like, what are we going to do with them? Like, and normally I think that would be a question that would really stay within the, within the N3, within ops's lane. Um, But my CO was, awesome. And he's like, I want to know, like, what, what do you think? How? And I was like, okay, I'll tell you what I think. It's great. 
That is cool. And, and so there's probably several parts to this and maybe you can help us break down, but like you're talking where you haven't even gone into a specific theater. It's more of like, you kind of have to know the whole yeah. region and then, Hey, here's what's blown up in Yemen. Maybe we need to redirect here. And then there's probably yeah. a follow on phase when you're in country and you're even closer to the tactical side of things. Yeah. And then, then it probably changes to more of the target packages, mm -hmm. um, developing an idea of the battlefield, right? So it's, it's yeah. more dynamic to your point. Yeah. And it's, it's keeping up with things and then also trying to figure out how to push that information out. And so when we were deployed, um, we had what we lovingly called the book, um, which was essentially started to get started being put together around midnight in UAE. And so the night shift guys would start to compile all of the key traffic that had come in, you know, white papers from the agency, things from DIA, key pieces of intel. And like it would the, the book would be printed on my desk when, you know, I got in there at like 637 and I would start going to town highlighting. And after that, I, I would have a, a one pager on the top where I'm like, boss, key stories. Here's the background. If you want more context, it's tabbed out. Give them the book. And one of the things about like, turns out when you highlight a bunch of things, you also actually end up retaining the information. And so I was able to really quickly build a lot of context of what's happening and start to thread things together of understanding, Hey, if something is kicking off over here, like it's like physics, every action has an equal opposite reaction, like other things happen in this other place. And so particularly in Afghanistan, where we had um, a platoon of guys and, but they were working very closely with Delta. They were working closely with dev crew folks. And so if something happened in Kandahar, well, we needed to understand how that was going to affect things in Helmand, what that meant for Logar, what that meant if you go into, what that meant for Kabul. Like if you have things that are starting to get a little bit spicy in Iran, like what does that mean for Herat? Yeah. And like all of these questions and like the, the more you can articulate, hey, this is what I think is important and actually get that out, the more credibility that you build. and. I think that that was one of the, one of the lessons that I probably learned a little later than I should have. And by a little later, I mean, like I learned it in like year four instead of year three, <laughs> but like nobody's going to come. It turns out like if everybody knows that, you know, your shit, like you don't have to have the rest of the bitch face. Like you can actually be a nice person. <laughs> That's like, they, oh, <laughs> they're coming to you when they know you know what's going yeah, I'm like, on. Oh, oh sure. you could, you could, you can still like me and I can still do my job. Well, okay. Like this. Good. Okay. So how do you, how did you make the jump or the decision to make the jump from the kind of the, um, as you described it, the open water yeah. track to this kind of, um, teams track? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing is, is that, um, I actually get a little bit seasick and I, I don't like, I don't like boats unless, unless they're sailboats. <laughs> like, I was like, I want no part of this. <laughs> I, just, I didn't want to be on a ship. And like the only, the, the thing for advancement would have been to be one of the air wing, to be the air wing Intel officer, which still would have put me back on the carrier. And it also meant that I'd be living in Lamore, which I feel I'm, for anybody who does not know where Lamore, California is, it is 45 minutes southwest of Fresno. The commercial, like good cheese from comes from happy cows, happy cows come from California, happy cows come from Lamore. So like the whole town smells <laughs> like cow manure and jet fuel. It's not, it's not a great combination. place. combination. Not a great place to be single. Fun fact. So <laughs> it's like, I don't want to go back there. Um, it, it just didn't interest me. And, but what did interest me was, all of the intel that we were getting from, from the ground. So when I was up to, when I was up to actually like work with the detailer for my next set of orders, it, it was the time where they were kind of doing this, like you sell your soul for a year and they give you like a really good job on the back end. And so um, I sold my soul to go, turns out by the way, I sold it a lot. Like I must be like a cat version of like selling your soul because I, I did that a lot for the jobs that I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> um, which normally like 
put me in a place that like nobody else really wanted to be. So like yeah. nobody was fighting with me for the year long assignment in Bahrain. Yep. The back end of that was to do a human assignment in at DIA um, in, in Washington, DC. And I was like, that is a no brainer trade. Like that is easy. So that and was so, a good move. You're saying like to do that, that year, a, Bahrain, come back and yeah. work DIA. Any, any soul selling I have done has actually been very, very career Enhancing. good for my career, not career limiting. Why, <laughs> why is it better to go to DIA in that setting for, for an Intel officer's career? Um, so the DIA human part wasn't, but I knew that it was something that was going to be vastly different from what I had done. And so like the worst case, like I learn a whole other, a whole other skill that I can then hopefully apply somewhere else. Like at that point in time, again, I also thought that I was going to stay in for like 20 years and be a captain. And so I wanted to be able to have as much experience as possible across disciplines to actually have at least make myself almost like more marketable from a promotion standpoint. Yeah. Um, so I went to Bahrain and I get there and they're like, okay, so we're actually not going to have you on the watch floor. We're going to have you do this other thing, but we can't tell you about it yet because you're not read in. And I was like, great. I don't know what getting read in means, but fine. And so it was like, maybe like two weeks went by and I was like, what the hell am I doing here? And so I asked this other girl who was on this team, who was read in, there were two of us. It was like me and her. And she like hands me two like Newsweek articles on Somalia. And I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? Like this tells me nothing. And then I got read in and I was like, oh, oh, this is where the cool stuff happens. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm and, here for that. And if we and can, so, like, like you had mentioned the, the watch office or anything you could be read into, like I would a million times take the other side of like, if it's something secret and not the watch. So the watch office is what, like a giant op center. You're just watching Intel come in, alerting people. It's like a shift work. Yep. Um, not Every, very and dynamic. Bahrain, all everybody is waiting for is like, what happens with Iran? Yeah. Like I, there, I distinctly remember like in there was an admiral that came into town who was like, where are you going to be when like we go to war with Iran? And all I can think of is like, not on this island. <laughs> Hopefully. Be halfway across the, the causeway to Saudi by then. I don't care if they don't let women drive. Yeah. I'm gone. I'm not staying here. <laughs> so that's a great, so you sell your soul, but then end up in a, sounds like a pretty sweet assignment mm -hmm. in the end. Pretty sweet gig. And then, so I go to DIA. Um, I do all of like the, um, all of the non-clandestine human training. So the defense strategic debriefing course, um, learn how to build rapport with people, which is something where I was like, great. I've been training for this since I, I was like this. three years old and could talk. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> um, and then came back and they're like, so they, originally I was supposed to go to Mosul for a deployment, um, things ended up happening and they're like, Hey, so this was maybe like right before Thanksgiving. And they're like, are you cool with leaving in January and going to Afghanistan? And I was like, sure. I was like, I don't really care. You can send me wherever. That's why like, I came here. They're like, <laughs> sorry, what? most people don't, don't say that just for people, people listening who are like, yeah, reaction. everybody's like that, but no, people are not like that. <laughs> And so I found myself on a plane um, to Bagram. I get to Bagram and they're like, yeah, we're not going to keep you. We're going to keep you in Bagram. We're not going to keep you in Bagram. We're going to send you up north. Is that okay? And I'm like, why does everybody keep asking if that's okay? I'm in the military. I don't get a choice. Like, yeah. but sure, that's okay. And so started out embedded with um, some army SF guys up in Afghanistan um, in the north got to see a ton of Northern Afghanistan as they would go out to various outstations that they had. Um, and then, then I got a call that was like, Hey, we need you in Kabul with the inevitable follow-up question. Is that okay? And I'm like, again, <laughs> sure. I was like, what am I doing in Kabul? And they're like, nobody knows yet. They won't tell us. And I was like, 
Nice. Thing. So the last time nobody told me anything that worked out pretty well. So like, let's do it. Great. Like then we got like the number six guy in East Africa, Al Qaeda. So I'm really interested in what this is going to be. And so I get down there and they're like, what do you know about the ISAF staff? And I was like, approximately zero. Why? And they're like, all right, so we're going to take you to meet some people. So we walk into the staff and the, the chief of staff at the time was like, it was a Navy SEAL. And he's like, do you have, do you have a suit? And I was like, no, I came to Afghanistan. Like I stocked up. I went to REI and got like full on contractor casual. No, I don't have a suit. He's like, we'll see if you can borrow one from somebody because I need you at the soccer field at 4 a.m. tomorrow. We're flying to Kandahar. And I was like, okay okay cool and like and that was it so at the soccer field at 4 a.m the next day wearing a borrowed suit that miraculously fits um with my contractor casual hiking boots i looked nice. so chic um <laughs> and like the ISS stop comes this is when stan mccrystal was the isaf commander so you had mccrystal Flynn, like the whole wow. entourage is getting on helicopters. And I was like, just looking around and all of a sudden dude's like, are you getting on the helicopter or not? And I was like, where are we going? He's like, we're going to Kandahar. And I was like, my mother's going to kill me. I'm so glad she doesn't know about this. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so we on. get, we get to Kandahar. I'm thinking that we're just like dropping in doing kind of like the outpost, like, Hey, hi, like hand wave. No, no, mm -mm. we are there for the, this massive presidential visit with all of the elders in Southern Afghanistan. Wow. Ahmed Wali Karzai is there. He speaks wonderful English. He's like, Oh, what do you, did you want my phone number? If you need anything, like you just call me. And I was like, I feel comfortable. <laughs> and meanwhile, like I am writing things down, like as fast, I had to like put my hand in ice later, it's like writing everything down as fast as I possibly could. I was like, this is going to be great. I'm going to get here. Like DA is going to be like, how did we get like 18 reports coming from one afternoon? Well, because I wrote everything down. <laughs> so the, and, and for people listening, you're writing it down for Intel reports. Every single thing. To just crank them out, all right? Every single cool. thing. There'd be times where, like, the translator would, like, stumble, and they're still talking, and I was like, what did they say? And he's like, nothing. And I'm like, oh, bullshit, what did they say? <laughs> Go ask. He's like, no, 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 it wasn't important. Yeah, and important. I was like, mm, no, it's important. You and so we have this massive dinner. The president's there, and, like, you know, General McChrystal's next to Karzai, and I am, like, trying to, like, tuck myself behind somebody else, so I am not noticeable also as I continue to write everything down. And so I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing, and then everybody, like, there's no talking. And it's just like dead quiet. And I'm like, so I turn, I look and like, as far as I was looking at me, <laughs> of course, I'm only one of two women who were there, maybe. And I'm like, I just looked at me and he's like, you're too thin, you need to eat more. And like calls for more food to be up bought it. It is a it is a platter that is one of the largest platters of food that I have ever seen. And I was like, okay, so platters could bully pull out. All and you have me. to eat it, right? Got it. I have to eat it. It is hands down some of the best food that I've ever had in my life. All right. It was delicious. positive outcome. That's good. They had a they had a pomegranate sauce that I don't. Uh, it, it was fantastic. And like I can remember later having like Afghan interpreters and like, there's this thing and they're like, Oh yeah, no, they literally rub the grains of rice against stones so that they can make the rice smooth every grain of rice. And I was like, yeah, I don't have that kind of time, wow. but if you could just tell me how to make the sauce, that would be great. I love it. <laughs> but that's, that's so, something you never would have done if you were in a back seat somewhere, right? Like if, if parallel life, would have done. you never would have never would have done. That's and great. just kind of continued. And like, so I went with the staff everywhere. And when they, they, when I couldn't go, like if they went to Pakistan and then came back and I would show up with their favorite snacks and they'd be like, Murdoch, I'm too tired. <laughs> Sorry, I brought, brought the peanut M&Ms for you. And 
the exchange has been out of them for weeks. Shake, 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 shake. Look, looks at me and he's like, oh. fine, give me the bag. You have 15 minutes. That's <laughs> like, awesome. Not, not above using, using food as bribery. No. It's cheaper and way more legal. So. <laughs> <laughs> So quickly, as you were talking about your time with the SF unit, right? Like before you go to mm-hmm. ISAP staff and they're running ops, are you developing target packages for them or giving them intel on where they're going to no. go hit targets? No, nope. that was all theirs. I really tagged along to be to be the strategic debriefer. And so there were a couple of times where like they'd go to outstations and they would have like massive essentially like open clinics and they'd have the corpsmen or the medics take a look at people. And like the best way to get people to talk is to talk to the ladies. And so I had an interpreter with me anytime anybody came in, like as part of like the registration, like we'd talk through, they'd give me all of their information, be like, how is your town? Is your village safe? Like, do you have Taliban coming through? Do you have Haqqani? Da, 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 this, that, and the other. And like, you get anything you wanted to know. I was like, this is great. And then I got to play with their kids, which is kind of, you know, also nice, you know, nice little thing. You, It's, it's very easy to forget people are human and people have families. And like, you can distance yourself from it to an extent, but like, it requires an element of compassion. And I think like the, the SF guys that I I were with, like they treated everybody who they saw with like utter grace and compassion, um, which is just, you know, something else that like stays with you. Like you see people who are, who will treat Afghans or Yemenis or whomever, like they're second or third rate things not even people, just things. Yeah. And like, you just, you can't do that. Um, you, you lose that humanity and you start, you start making bad decisions. And so you didn't see that, which is good. That's great to hear. Yeah. I, I have to imagine that ISAF role sets you up. Like, is that how you get your foot in the door with the teams, like coming out of high level staff like that? Um, so that is, that actually brings us to, um, soul selling number two. Okay. Um, so I get back, I finish up the rest of the time at, at DIA. Um, I am during the, my time at DIA, I'm augmented to health and human services to be their strategic debriefer on staff. Um, which is also quite interesting. Um, I learned very quickly that I don't sneeze right per HHS. Like I'm not one of those like cough or sneeze in the elbows. Like I yeah. do have my hands and then I like, I wash my hands cause I'm normal. Um, so again time came up for orders and they're like well we have we have this thing but you have to go to Afghanistan for a year and I was like "Mm, how do it how long do do I have can I think about it (laughs) and like this is the time where I was I was like, do I want, I was like right at the five-year mark. And I was like, do I want to stay in? Do I want to get out? Like, what do I want to do? I was maybe at like six years. And I had just, maybe I had been home for, I had been home for Afghanistan for maybe, maybe a month. And I got a phone call from one of my good friends, 2004 Naval Lacrosse player, um, and let me know that a guy who was in my company, who's a good friend of mine, was killed in Afghanistan. A guy named Brendan Looney. Um, a lot of people know of him. Um, he and his best friend, Travis Mannion, are buried side by side at Arlington National Cemetery. Um, Travis and Brendan were both in my company at the academy. Um, hands down, two of the absolute finest human beings that have ever like graced my life. Um, And so I was, I was, I mean, devastated. Um, Also because Brendan was really close. He was maybe a couple of weeks away from coming home. 
Um, oh. And and he had been he had been killed. Um, helicopter got shut down and shut down in Zabul. Um, and yeah, it was just tragic. And yeah. so I remember when the order, the question about orders came through, and I went to Arlington and I just like sat down between the two of them for hours. I was just like, what, what do I do? Like, I need a sign. I need, I need something. And so I went back on Monday, I called the detailer again. I was like, he said that there was, what's the thing after Afghanistan? And they're like, oh, it's to be the end to it, SEAL Team 3. SEAL Team 3 was the team that Brendan was at when he was killed. Wow, wow. I also then just found out that Brendan's middle brother, Steven, had also been assigned to SEAL, had just been assigned to SEAL Team 3. And I was like, got it, guys. Thank you. Very clear sign. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so very, amazing. Very clear. Wow. Um, so I went back to Afghanistan for 15 months um, to work as part of the Afghanistan threat finance cell, which was really cool and getting to work with treasury, understanding like the sanctions process, yeah. like the intersection between like terrorist money, drug money, like some of those are very different things. Like, and so following the money and like what that was actually like. So now I started putting together like totally different target packages and totally different pieces of of Intel and working it worked with the Brits some like it was just it was fascinating to get a different type of exposure and understanding like okay like really what happens when you start to follow the money and yeah. that's again something that served me really well when I got to team three and then and then later on at at Devger is looking beyond just who's carrying a gun. Yeah. What what are people's roles? Like, how are, are they replaceable? Like, yes, you might have the head honcho, but like, who's his succession plan? Like, who's the guy right after him? And like, nine times out of 10, it's the guy with the money. Yeah. <laughs> and so like thinking through, you know, the war on terror, it's the war on terror's money. It's all money. Yeah. Like that's where, that's where it is. And, and, the, and the, like the link analysis, the networks that you probably uncover uh -huh. and they certainly go outside of the country all of origin it. like that's a great all place it. to cut your teeth i'm sure before you and go thinking like about everything that i did it when i was at navset in bahrain like that's where i learned to do yeah. all of the network analysis and there was a period of time where i was like i know families in who data their family tree like better than i know my own <laughs> right i know it, it is really funny like that is i think an intel community thing where you just understand mm -hmm. the target so well yeah yeah oh that's cool okay so that's a, an yeah. interesting assignment not really a bad one like good one not a bad one it was, was long, awesome i months, learned but... i learned a ton and halfway through my time there they were like go down to the combined special operations joint top like go down to see just soda and go talk to them like have you're gonna sit with them and you're going to work with all of special forces in Afghanistan, we're going to find how to go after the money. And I was like, okay, great. And so we did. So good. And, okay. and it was yet again, people are like, like, Hey, what is your opinion? Hey, what do you think? I was like, this is, this is great. This is awesome. Kristen, is it odd to think that it wouldn't be very competitive to try to get like a, an N2 slot on a SEAL team? I would imagine like they don't take anybody. Um. I don't know. There are some. <laughs> Let's just say that there are people who sold their souls and got the job. And here you're like, Ooh, yeah. I don't okay. know about you. So you still get um, that. Yeah. I mean, I, I got to team three and like my alpha was a disaster. Like I had team guys so coming right to me. Person. Team guys coming to me within like, days, weeks of me being there who they're like, we, we don't, we don't like him. We don't trust him. <laughs> like wow. he doesn't do anything right. Um, and it's not because he didn't have the aptitude. He was apathetic. He just didn't care. And I'm like, you can't, you can't be in this job and not care. You, I mean, you can't care too much, but like, you can't not care. Like 
you are holding, potentially holding people's lives, like in your hands, you you have to care. And we ended up, we ended up getting him reassigned, um, which is fine. They were like, you're going to have to go and deploy one person down. And the team that I had was an absolutely amazing chief who is a senior chief now. And he and I later worked together um, at dev group. Like he's awesome. Absolutely amazing. Um, two, um, two female Intel specialists. Also, one got out after I think she was, she went through DIA and was actually out at Tel Aviv at the embassy. Cool. Also badass. Another who's a senior chief now, equally awesome. And then <laughs> apparently getting rid of the alpha meant they're like, well, we're going to give you two ISs. And I was like, cool. And they're like, they're fresh out of a school, like they're fresh out of school. <laughs> it was like, oh boy. All right. <laughs> and you know what? I wouldn't have, I, I don't think I I have ever deployed with a better team than those humans. Wow. Like they were incredible. We went through some growing pains. We went through like some leadership lessons, um, on both ends. They learned things. I learned things. Um, but they also, they, they learned, they, they grew up and I got to watch them grow up. And like, that was one of the, best parts about leading a team that I had that I hadn't experienced yet because I just inherited people who already knew what they were doing yeah. and here it was actually like shaping and molding them and it's something that I was like ah, this is what I want this is partially what of what I want to do and so even when I went to DevGrew the work was great the opportunities were great I had a lot of challenges with my boss um it didn't again not do north but pretty close and like there were decisions that were being made that i just wasn't comfortable with and i mean as an intel officer like i want us to be doing things that are going to like further the mission i'm not here for legacy building frankly i don't care like if we're the ones who put people back in wherever for the first time since whatever like it doesn't yeah, matter to yeah. me and so particularly then when we lost, you know, we lost two guys and it was also like about the same time that like ever, I think everybody is now aware after like all of the hearings and everything of like the phone call that sucked off me to Trump about like, Hey, do we have your approval to go do this? And he's like, I don't know. basically it was like, it's your choice, <laughs> your call. And like, that was when January, 2017, I was like, Mm, this might not be, this might not be for me anymore. I don't, I don't know if I'm comfortable. I don't know if I'm comfortable with this because although I didn't know the two guys who we lost, like inevitably it would be somebody that I knew. And we are starting to see one of the interesting things about being an intel officer, very quick side, is that like you're anywhere from like two to four years ahead of your classmates. And so like, all of my classmates who went aviation, they were showing up to the squadrons as I was leaving. Similarly, like as I was at Dubker, like as I was leaving, the guys that I knew who were in my class were showing up because like now they're just starting to like, they're getting to that point. And so I was like, inevitably it'll, it'll be somebody that I know. And from a mental wellness resiliency standpoint, like not, not going to be able to do that. And then and then my boss sidelined me and had me do some like pretty, pretty weird projects, like calculating, like, like doing cost benefit analysis of like a, a tomahawk strike, like of a missile drone strike versus like doing a raid and I was like calling up all of these companies being like, what's the fuel burn rate of your plane? Come <laughs> like, on. Wow. And it was one of those things where like, I knew he was doing it. He was doing it because he could. And so I was like, well, I'm, fine. It's, I'm stubborn. So I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to deliver and then I'm getting the hell out of here. And June 1st, 2017 pulled shocks and I was out. Oh man. Was, was your boss in that case, a seal or an Intel officer? Intel officer. Oh, that sucks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So you was like, this. he wanted a very specific thing. And like, I wasn't that thing and that's okay. Was it like he, he wanted another guy who would just kind of do? No, what I think he, he just said? wanted a different, I, he wanted a, a yes personality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And like, again, I'm not everybody's cup of tea or shot of whiskey. So like, it's, it's okay. <laughs> but So you had mentioned a couple of times, like, so you, losing people. And then earlier on in our discussion, you had said, you know, at, at some point you're making decisions that have life and death outcomes for the people. Could you take us maybe to the first time you developed Intel or you were like, you handed somebody a package for a mission that you really were giving them a green light from an Intel perspective where they were going downrange to do something harmful, like that may have laid um, on you. So I got, I was really I was really lucky in that I never had, I was always confident in what we put forward. So like for me, there wasn't, I wasn't going to put something forward that I wasn't comfortable with. Let's put it that way, yep. which was the beginning of the end um, for me at, at Decker. Cause I just walk out of the room. Like I'm not, I'm not, not doing this. <laughs> but even like you didn't feel I, I just, so my Intel career wasn't like that. I was always collecting like raw Intel and wasn't putting together a package or like, hey, if you're going on this objective, here's what you're going to see with the potential that it could be wrong if I got it wrong. I, it just seems like there would be a weight of responsibility that I have to have this thing right. Or did you just have like really strong confidence? Uh, so one of my, one of my little baby Intel specialist Seaman was like, ma'am, I have a question for you. And I was like, what? And he's like, how are you always right? And I was like, it's really easy. Because when I'm wrong, I keep my damn mouth shut. Like, I wasn't going to put anything forward unless I was 100% absolutely confident. And it had been corroborated many different, like, also, particularly on, like, the right the non deck crew side of things like well actually on both sides of things like it had to be airtight it was going through like eighty six thousand different approval chains and so like you didn't there was no by the time i hit the teams there wasn't this like flying fast and loose with like whatever you happen to it. get um which was good and bad like it didn't mean that you missed opportunities yes um didn't mean that you probably prevented horrible things from happening to people you care about also yes yeah D did you talk to team three about brandon when you got there or did you keep that to yourself oh yeah i mean i didn't i didn't have a choice as soon as you walk in the building um had his oh, boots gosh. rifle helmet um and i and i passed it and also like stevie was there and so like of course, the like brother, he sees me and like brother. screams and yeah. starts running down the hallway and everything's like, oh God. Wow. <laughs> but like that, you probably felt a similar thing walking past the wall at the agency. Yeah. Like yeah. it's grounding. It reminds you, you have a job to do. Um, you're doing that job for a reason and it's not for the fame and glory and it certainly isn't for the money. <laughs> so no. like, Lord knows that. Right. And so all the way back to the beginning, you have to want it and you have to be doing it for a reason that is bigger than just you. What, what, what was the transition like to dev crew? Um, just from the caliber of people, resources, was it as big a jump as people might expect? Um, in some ways, yes, like the resources were bananas. I was like, I remember going through and they're like, okay, go down to the warehouse and pick up your gear. And I think that I'm getting like, you know, a vest, a helmet, like a couple of things. And they're like, okay, so here are your three like big ginormous duffel bags. Here's your wetsuit. Here's your dry suit. Here's like this wetsuit. And I was like, why do I need all of this stuff? And they're like, just in case. And I was like, guys, if I need this just in case, like that means that everything has gone really really wrong like no yes but like they give it to you anyway and you're like okay well i'll just keep it and like put it in the cage and then i'll come back and 
turn it back in when I leave in two years. Yeah. So it's bit, we, we always just heard that. And I noticed this at the agency too. It's kind of like grown up rules. Like nobody's watching you to hold your yeah. hand. They're not going with you and signing out. All right. You got all these things and we yeah. see it. It's you're like, go get what you need to, be to act like time. an adult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there were people who acted like adults and there were people who didn't. And you know, but you also had people who, again, like the, is it worth it? Like you had people who would pop positive, like just pop and positive for Coke. And you're like, really? For this, yeah. Really? Okay. Oh. Okay. And like, you're a dev guru. It's not like you're fresh out of buds. Like you've been doing this for a while and you got there because you're really good at it. And you're going to throw it all away on like a line of Coke. Yeah. How was the reception for you there? And maybe let's start there. How how were you received coming into dev crew as a woman, as coming from team three, however you take it, like, what was that like coming in? Maybe your boss aside, Um, if if that was ugly from the start. Yeah. I think, um, honestly, I think pretty well. Um, I'm, the hard part about leaving was that I never had a problem with the team guys, like, because they appreciated, like you tell the truth, you do what you're supposed to do when you said you were going to do it with like a high quality to their standard. And like, you're good. And similarly, like I, I wasn't going to be a seal. I didn't want to be a seal. Like, no. And so like, they didn't, there was never this tension of, Oh, well, she has a chip on her shoulder because like she went through buds and washed out or she wants to be a seal, but couldn't be like, there was, there's, there was none of that because I was like, I don't, y'all do you, I'm going to do me <laughs> and we'll be fine. Um, and so like it, there just, there wasn't an issue. It, it was really with some of the support staff and particularly a couple of people within the Intel shop that I was just like, no, okay, got it. Like this is, and it, it wasn't something that it was immediate. Like it was stuff that happened over time where like, again, you can just tell people who are in it for the right reasons and people who are in it because they want to yeah. be like, Oh no, I came from Duggar. Mm-hmm. I was like, no, that is not what I lead off with. Oh man. <laughs> how, how hard was the transition for you getting out? coming from a military family all this time in you're at the pinnacle of where you can be. And then you kind of have a tough exit. It sounds like the last six months probably weren't fun. Yeah. Um, it was like, I've never been married, but it would, is like what I would imagine is like the roughest divorce possible that like you didn't see coming. And it was really, really tough. And I'm incredibly lucky that, um, I got involved in a transition program called the honor foundation. Um, they work with special operators and support staff to basically like on a three month program to help them transition out. And like, if I hadn't had that, I would have been in a much worse place. It was like part professional development, part therapy. And then I was also in therapy. So like (laughs) a lot, a lot going on there. Um, and then the second thing that I was really lucky about is um, I was accepted to the Stanford 9-11 Ignite program. And so for, I think, six weeks, um, we were at the Stanford Graduate School of Business doing a program where you get a certificate in entrepreneurship at the end. And so it's kind of like an intro to an MBA, which also made me really glad that I didn't go to business school because, again, not good at math. Never would have made it through finance. <laughs> but I really did like. I liked the tech environment. I liked the startup environment. And so I realized that there between that and the honor foundation, I was like, Oh, I, I don't have to just go into contracting. I don't have to just go to the agency. I don't have to just go into I banking and be at Goldman Sachs. Um, not, and not that there are anything wrong with any of those things, but that's not what I wanted. Like I knew I could go to the agency. I knew it'd be great. I didn't want that lifestyle. Like, I felt like because I had been deployed for almost the entire time that I had been in the military, like I wasn't present for things. I didn't know my friends, like I never saw my family. And so like part of that decision was like, I need to do something that I can be more present. And so 
one of the things we did is like went around to a bunch of the tech companies, went to Oracle, Google, Facebook, Airbnb, and then like two other small startups. <laughs> and like went to Facebook, it's like the height of intern season. Like everybody's running around with like on skateboards and cargo shorts. And like, <laughs> I was like, this is, I'm there with a bunch of like former operators and everybody's got like our jeans and our blue blazers on because clearly yeah. we all still dress the same. And I was like, feel like an arc. This is like, take your parents to work day. It was, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't ever want to work here. And then through the Ignite program, we went back again and I got to meet some folks from who are working in the policy space, who are working in kind of like the broader trust and safety integrity space. I was like, oh, this is actually really cool. This is what I wanted. This is where the adults are. I got it. I want to do this. Um, and then I ended up reaching out to the recruiter and I sent her like a list of like 10 jobs at Facebook that I was like, I think these are interesting. I don't know if I'd be good at any of them, but like, I'm interested. And so she called me and she's like, you're far too senior for any of the things that you sent over. There's this other job. We haven't listed it yet. Would you be interested? And I was like, Sure don't even know what the job is. I'm like, yeah, sure. That sounds like great. <laughs> and so this may be like, sell. this may be like selling my soul, like maybe 2.5. Um, and so I went through the interview process and like the more people I talked to, the more excited I was. And I was like, this is, you start to get that feeling of like, this is exactly where you're supposed to be. And, and so I got, I was offered the job um, said, sure, let's do it. And then was it at Facebook now meta for almost five years. Um, ironically enough, kind of ran into similar, some similar leadership challenges. Um, really where I felt like uh. I, I, I mean, I just, I wasn't necessarily being valued. I didn't feel like I was being invested in from like a growth and development perspective. Um, and at the end of the day, like it, it, it's similarly, like, I just couldn't, I couldn't make it click with, with my boss. And unfortunately, like loved the team, loved the mission, loved what we did, but I needed to change. And so got, got looped into this role at Twitch again, very similarly, I had people refer me to it and like got a call from the crew. I was like, this is great did the interviews and I was like, again, really excited about what it was. And then found myself in London right after 4th of July, where my first day was the first day of their first in-person leadership summit after COVID. And it was that same, like, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. And, and so everything kind of, again, everything just kind of happens for a reason. Um, but I think I've also been lucky enough that every time that I've left something that I've loved, I've left loving it, not regretting it, which is a big difference, I think, in how people leave and then feel about things moving forward. Yeah. I will say, um, and I'm sure this happens to you, I get calls all the time for people leaving the military and the intel community. And I'll mention trust and safety as like, you mm -hmm. should check this out. No one's ever heard of it. It's all the yeah. stuff we've been trained to do for years. Same yeah. actors, like a lot of the same actors, depending on where you come from. Mm -hmm. um, inner, you know, like yeah. geopolitical issues. Yeah. All, uh, it's I mean, it's a great I, mean I thought the pinnacle of like my, my Navy Intel career was going to be like getting rid of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is like adorable, but like absolutely not going to happen. And then I get to Facebook and I was like, oh, terrorism is such a, like a teeny tiny little part of like what the problem is that we're trying to solve for. And, you know, when I started at Facebook, it was, you know, well, why did we remove like this black activist piece of content where she used the N word self-referentially, which then very quickly became like, Hey, why are we on the front page of the New York times? We're stoking sectarian violence in Myanmar and Sri Lanka. Yeah. So like, Hey, we're building this independent body to like think through our content decisions and the creation of the oversight board. And then like, well, maybe we should send the oversight board the, to tell us whether or not we should keep Trump on the platform after January 6th. And all of these things happen. And you realize like, you are just, you are such a small piece in all of it, but you're a really important piece. And 
particularly when you think about like the power that social media does have and like it's cheesy but like even at twitch like there are communities of people who've come together because they don't have a community and they can't have a community maybe you have an lgbtqia plus gamer who's in florida who can't connect to anybody because it's literally illegal for them now (laughs) and they need they need a community and they need an outlet and they find it they find it on twitch they find it on facebook they find it on instagram like we've it's now now it's even more paramount to think about how we keep them keep those people safe and so you're exactly right it's exactly what we were born and bred to do it's just with a different audience yep and at a scale that most people have cannot imagine you know like millions billions yeah um Okay, so I'll get you out of here. There's two questions I like to ask everybody. Yeah. One is when you were deploying all those times, was there anything that you always wanted to have with you on a deployment that had like sentimental value, good luck charm, something that somebody gave you? Yeah. Um, so my I have a clatter ring. Um, even though my parents, my dad's side of the family is Scottish, nobody in our family is Irish. Um, but I've they gave me my first clatter when I was like nine years old. And so I've never not had it. The only time that I've not had it on was when I had to go through like the graduate level of Sears school and take it off. And like, there was a, I thought I was going to have to like cut my finger off. Um, but that, and then um, I'd always have like a St. Jude and St. Christopher medal with me on my dog tags. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing that I ask everybody, and I didn't realize the the difficult exit you had from the Navy. So um, just looking back at the time you had there across your career, uh, knowing that you lost people the way you described with all that in mind, would you go back and do that again? Absolutely. 100%. You would, it's the butterfly effect, right? Like if you, my life could be vastly different, I could have made vastly different choices. Every single one of those choices, every single one of the second and third order effects of those choices, the choices of others, like it, it made me who I am now. And similar to like when I got in trouble at the academy, like I'd much rather learn some of those lessons when it was acceptable to be young and dumb and stupid at, you know, 19, 20 years old than finding it out the hard way. And so I wouldn't, as tough as things were, I wouldn't change a thing because it inevitably prepared me for things that were harder, that were more challenging, that were tougher decisions, um, and gave me gave me a foundation to actually really think through them in a way that was intentional and mature and not rushed. And so, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't change a single thing. Love it. Well. Thank you very much for the time here. I took yeah. this over. I think what I promised, but it was a lot of fun. That's okay. Um, I think people, <laughs> I haven't interviewed a ton of people with Intel backgrounds. It's just, it can be difficult with uh, all the stuff that we've done. Um, just yeah. such a cool story that you have and, and the journey that you took. So thanks for sharing it all with us. Really appreciate yeah. it, Kristen. Really happy to. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed today's combat story. We've got a few comments from listeners that we wanted to share. The first one is a five-star review from Apple Podcast, courtesy of Bailey McCormick. It says, if you aren't listening to combat stories, what are you doing? After some time now of listening to this podcast, I can definitely say it's the best one I've heard. If you're looking for some inspiration or just some understanding of the triumphs and struggles of some of the most amazing men and women out there, then this is for you. Ryan is one of the best interviews interviewers I've listened to. Keep it up, Ryan. Thank you for the great show. What more can I say? Thanks for taking the time to leave that, Bailey. I think it really helps, especially on Apple, for people to see these, these types of reviews as they have a whole lot of things to search for. Uh, making sure that they can find these is really a result of people's comments. So thank you for doing that. We had a couple comments on YouTube that I wanted to share. One was on the Farida Mohammadi interview. If you all recall, Farida is part of the uh, female tactical platoons in Afghanistan. And this is from Lee Ming. It says, thank you for showcasing a female special operator. Um, and that, that was the whole point of that interview was sharing what it was like from a slightly different perspective. And then today, obviously, we heard from Kristen, who <laughs> being a female in DevGrew, uh, one of 
the very few who have had that honor. So I thought it was fitting that we shared a comment on Farida's interview. Then I had two comments left on YouTube on the Joe Hotai uh, interview. And that first one was from Ozzy Anzac. He says, oh brother, who else is smiling from ear to ear as Joe is remembering and sharing? Cheers for sharing this. And I think um, if y'all have seen that episode or just listened to it, uh, Joe's got such an infectious smile, such a a gentle person for being uh, tough as nails door kicker. And he had me on his podcast as well, which should be coming out soon. So you get another, another take of us reminiscing on our time together. And then uh, the last one here also related to the Joe Hotai, and this is from AG. It says, man, this dude's story resonates with me an awful lot. I think many of us young men these days go through these circumstances and we need to hear these stories. What a solid dude, a true hero. And one thing that I really appreciated about Joe and why it's had um, a lot of success as one of our, our podcasts here is that he was really open about his mistakes from ego, uh, walking away from great opportunities, um, and the chances he took that paid off, but also coming from very humble beginnings to where he is now. He just gives so much even today when he's out of service with a couple podcasts, YouTube channels, training other people. He's such a giving person. So glad to see y'all felt the same way. Thanks for leaving these comments. Keep them coming um, and stay safe, y'all.